Tonight, we are excited to welcome James J. Butcher and Jim Butcher. In the tradition of his renowned father, James J. Butcher's debut novel, Dead Man's Hand, is a brilliant urban fantasy about a young man who must throw out the magical rule book to solve the murder of his former mentor. On the streets of Boston, the world is divided into the ordinary usuals and the paranormal unorthodox. And in the Department of Unorthodox Affairs, the auditors are the magical elite, government-sanctioned witches with spells at their command and all the power and prestige that comes with it. Grimshaw, Griswold, Grimsby is not one of those witches. After flunking out of the auditor's training program and being dismissed as not department material, Grimsby tried to resign himself to life as a mediocre witch, but he can't help hoping he'll somehow, some way, get another chance to prove his skill. That opportunity comes with a price when his former mentor, AKA the most dangerous witch alive, is murdered down the street from where he works. And Grimsby is the auditor's number one suspect. Butcher will be joined in conversation by his father, Jim Butcher, author of the best-selling Dresden Files series and many, many other books. The evening's event will include an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. And if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, you can even upvote that particular question. Perhaps most importantly, please support James and Powell's by purchasing copies of Dead Man's Hand from us. Links to buy that book and Jim's book, uh, Jim's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. James, Jim, we're so excited to host you tonight. Thanks a lot for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think we're just going to kind of start off. Uh, 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 this is Jay's new book, James's new book release. He's the star here. So uh, I'm going to be interviewing him and asking him questions. And uh, after a bit, we'll we'll cut over to the audience Q and A, and and we'll we'll try and answer some questions for you all. Uh, if that sounds all right with you guys, works for me certainly. All right. All right. Well, new author, uh, uh, just now wading into the fray, as it were. Um, when did you first start writing? When did you when did you write your first novel? Uh, first started writing and first novel very different. Um, okay. So first started writing uh, in high school and just assumed I'd be a, a New York Times bestseller by nineteen or twenty. You know that that seemed reasonable at the time. Okay. Uh, for, finished my first book. Uh, I think I was uh, about twenty two uh, by the time I actually fit, we got to write the end and it was honest. Right. Um, but uh, no one will ever see that book. It will never see the light of day. Uh, I have a printed <laughs> off version that is in the closet for for posterity and humility's sake. So uh, I, whenever I'm feeling a little too confident, I can go take a look at that one. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just it was a, a pretty long road from there on. But uh, Grisby, I think, is book uh, book number seven. So this will be the, the seventh book I ri I've written and the first book anyone will read. Yeah, that's pretty good. I, I, mine, mine was the eight, so you did one better than I did. Um, all right, um, and how did you decide? How did you decide? I, I want to write books. That's what I want to do. What was what was your motivating factor for that? Uh, well, you know, I had a I had somebody in the household who wrote books, and he seemed to be doing pretty well for himself. And uh, it was it was one of those things that it just kind of I didn't really think otherwise for a long time. I just kind of assumed that I was going to be a writer because why wouldn't I? And when I first started actually writing, I was like, this is this is pretty hard, actually. And uh, it took me a while to figure out that 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 difficulty and that challenge was part of the reason why I wanted to be a writer. And I thought it would be um, it was a, it was a worthy goal to, to strive for. Oh, I like that. That's a good answer. You're making me look good here, kid. Thank you. <laughs> Um, all right, but as far as as far as uh, 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 the Grimsby books, why did you decide? Why did you decide on those? What made you decide to to really start putting that that final push of effort into those? Well, part of the reason was um, a big question for me when I was writing was whether or not to write under a pen name, um, whether or not I wanted to have the, the the family legacy kind of write on the book a little bit, and uh, whether or not I wanted to to write something that would stand alone and kind of start from the ground up or whether I wanted to stand on greater shoulders, that, that sort of question. 
And I eventually decided that I, I kind of like my name. So I decided to write under that one. And uh, part of the reason I decided to go for Grimsby was because, well, there's a certain established uh, fan base for, for urban fantasy and, and the name, the butcher name. And Grimsby was my urban fantasy series that was the most pressing that I really wanted to write. Um, and it was the one of three that I was considering writing, one of three different series that are all different genres. Uh, but Grimsby was the one that was the urban fantasy genre that I thought stuck out the most. And I think urban fantasy was a really good place to start for a, for a newer writer as well. Well, I, I think you're not wrong. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm one of those people who believes that genre, of, you know, whatever genre is, that you shouldn't, as a writer, you shouldn't pursue a particular genre. You should you should pursue what you feel passionate about and what you, what you enjoy writing. Uh, uh, but yeah, probably not a dumb place to start. Um, tell me about I know about one of the other books you were thinking about. Tell me about the third one. I I know about your your cowboys with you know electric cowboys with landmines for eyes. Yeah, that that one's that one's in the works. Okay. Um, the the, uh, the other one was my uh, epic fantasy series that I've been wanting to write, um, and then after starting to write epic fantasy, I realized just how many more words epic fantasy takes, and uh, uh, the the amount of time and effort it takes to put epic fantasy onto the page versus urban fantasy is so much greater, um, just because the word count is so much higher. There's so much more to explore and explain for the readers that I thought the urban fantasy would be a little bit more of a, an appropriately leveled ambition to, to pursue. There are an awful lot of uh, uh, awful lot of balls to keep in the air while you're trying to juggle. Exactly. Story. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think urban fantasy adds an extra couple or fantasy adds an extra couple at least just because there's so much work to do to, to get the world set out and established. Yep. Um, well, let's talk about uh, uh, let's talk about your favorite stories. For you personally, what are some of your favorite stories? Not necessarily just uh, uh, just not uh, in novel form, but what are the stories that really inspire you and drive you forward? Um, the I think some of the best story that has ever been put to any medium is Avatar: The Last Airbender. Uh, I think that it it is one of the most well written and compelling stories. It's it's childish, but in a in a in a way that is it, it plays into and, and actually I think benefits it. Um, it has a very pure look at the at the world and has a as a stark light and darkness that kind of starts to become more mature and more grayscaled as the story pro progresses and continues. And watching it as a kid, uh, yeah, I got to see it and mature alongside the story in parallel. And so it was uh, for me personally, it was a very, very uh, uh, emotionally involved uh, ser series and show. Oh, very much so. Very much so. I, I remember watching the finale with you, how excited you guys were to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, anything else? Um, Babylon 5 is also a good one. Um, I, I grew up watching Babylon 5 and not appreciating it for a long time. Um, but <laughs> being reintroduced it when I was actually starting to write and uh, taking writing more seriously, I had a, a different perspective for it and was able to appreciate it much more. Um, and then uh, the, I, I mean, it's one of those things that I still have playing in the background while I'm writing or while I'm doing something else on my computer, just Babylon 5, just, just good television and good storytelling. Yeah, yeah. We just started watching season three uh, this afternoon. Excellent. Uh, you know, and that's where it gets really good. So I'm very excited. Babylon 5 is really, I think it's a writer's show in a lot of ways uh, because you really get to watch the, the craft and the, and the story play out over, over, you know, a considerable period of time. Certainly. Um, Although it's it wasn't meant for streaming, that's for sure. You know that, yeah. that was, was you were supposed to watch it week by week and sort of get that story dished out to you slowly. Yeah, the tension plays a lot better when you can't binge watch. Yeah, yeah, true enough. Um, all right, well, let's talk a little bit more about you. What kind of hobbies are you into? What's the sort of the sort of stuff that you do that kind of feeds your writing? Um, one of the big things that I, I pursue is, is lifting and weightlifting. Um, I'm a very, very amateur bodybuilder, uh, but I, uh, uh, I've found a lot of parallels when it comes to riding and weightlifting that I, I have used one to help fuel the other. Um, and those are the two kind of, uh, I, I would call them disciplines that I pursue as, as both hobbies and, and crafts. Um, but as far as, as just kind of purely creative hard hobbies go, I, I uh, just recently got myself a 3D printer. And I've been printing off uh, little miniatures to to paint for D and D games and wargaming and all that sort of thing. 
Um, I really enjoy the tabletop games, uh, board games as though as well. Um, I spend way too much time building decks for Magic the Gathering and not nearly enough time playing Magic the Gathering. Um, but it's one of the things I'm trying to rectify. Um, and uh, aside from that, uh, I think I can fit a little bit of painting of those miniatures in there, but not nearly as much as printing. Uh, that's been a problem lately. So I'm trying to get my my wall of shame uh, trimmed down a little bit lately. Right. Uh, so would you would you you know safely call yourself a nerd then at this point? I mean, despite I mean, bodybuilding. I mean, you could accuse me of being one if you'd like, sir. Um, I do so, sir. All right, I, I won't refute that. <laughs> All right. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more specifically about Dead Man's Hand itself. Sure. Uh, and about the, the world you're building there and the, and the story that you're building there. Um, what would you say your sources of inspiration were uh, on that story? I mean, because, you know, I know, I know you don't take me too seriously, nor should you as my son. Uh, uh, but I know there's a lot of other writers that, that you read, and I know there's, and uh, I was sort of wondering where you, where you were starting to draw some of your, uh, your story structure and your, and your character stuff from. Well, um, the character, the characters are, I mean, there's definitely a strong inspiration from, from real life there. I mean, I'm always going to have strong mentor figures in my books. Um, the, the young and old dynamic is something that I put a lot of effort into um like characters teaching other characters um but as far as the world goes a lot of the building i did for the world was practical rather than like forethought um like for instance one of the things that you start looking at when you're building urban fantasy and using magic obviously in a modern setting is that um how you want your magic to be portrayed in the world changes so like for instance you can't have magic replace cars and computers and television otherwise you're not writing modern fantasy anymore so you have to structure your story differently and your magic differently than you would in an epic fantasy series otherwise you're just replacing technology with magic and so i had to find a good balance for the urban fantasy setting for the magic to be something that was unique and relevant without being something that replaced and undermined what makes the setting urban instead of just fantasy. Um, and so I found a lot of that when I was writing, like I couldn't have the magic do certain things or the characters do certain things with the magic without starting to undermine more of the world and the story that was something that I wanted the, the reader to be able to feel familiar with and be able to assume parts about. Because the, the more of the common stuff that I would replace, the less the reader might feel certain when reading the book and reading the story that they knew what was going on in that setting. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about your writing process uh, uh, as, you're, as you're going through and actually putting the book together. I mean, a lot of times in a lot of these, in a, in, in a lot of these uh, uh, Q and A's, we have a lot of aspiring writers that are out there that are showing up and, you know, they're wanting to hear more about the, 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 the way that, uh, um, you know, people who have gotten somewhere are, are, are exercising their talent. So talk about your writing process. What, how do you start off? A, how do you start off a book? How do you proceed through it? Um, so I try to be uh, forward thinking when I start the book, I try to have, um, I, I like to call it milestones um, where I, if you're, if you're, you're starting at the top of one hill, looking over a valley to the top of the next hill, and then top of the next hill is where your story ends. You want to have landmarks between you and where you want your story to end so you know that you're on the right path. Um, so I have a half a dozen or maybe a dozen um, landmarks that I call them that are, I think, are basically just cool scenes that I want to include. I want something to be awesome and cool, and I make sure that I find a way to make the story hit those landmarks. Um, but I try to leave enough flexibility in between that I can add new landmarks that I kind of stumble upon when I'm writing or that I can uh, kind of diverge into other side plots that are going to help me explore later milestones down the road, like in other books and things like that. But I really like to have, you know, I'll, I'll go through and I'll, I'll put, you know, the 30 chapters that I start in, with the book with, and I'll give each chapter a name and a summary. And then by the time I'm finished actually going through it writing, there's actually like 45 or 50 chapters. And those, and most of them are chapter X or chapter, chapter question mark that I put around the other chapters. And then I have to go through and renumber them all again and such. Um, but I try to leave that flexibility while also having the structure of having those milestones to kind of hit on the way to the, the end goal. 
Okay. Where do you see yourself uh, uh, in the future? What, do you, what, what plans have you got coming up? Um, so I, I, I will be publishing three Grimsby books, uh, at, at least. Um, the, the second one should likely release next October, assuming everything goes according to plan. Um, it's, it's in the editing process right now. I've already shipped off the initial manuscript. Um, I'll be starting the third book manuscript sometime soon, but in the interim, I'm working on a different project. Um, my personal goal is to be able to consistently uh, write two books a year. Um, I want to be able to write one, likely a Grimsby book every year for the foreseeable future, and then another book that's a different project. Um, but it might be in the same setting, might be in a different setting, but some other projects have that flexibility so I can explore other, other you know, ideas and worlds that I want to work on. Sounds like a good plan, man. Or at least, least to me, you know, that's, that I, I would really like it to just, just, just have a butcher putting out books more regularly. I'm going to have to compete with you now so that uh, uh, perhaps I can do so as well. <laughs> All right. Um, that's the first 20 minutes or so. So we're going to go to some questions and answers. Uh, I've got to, got to look them up here. Um, all right. From Celia, uh, her, her question is, I love Dead Man's Hand. When can we expect book two? I'm hoping for more of the Kitty Familiar. Uh, book two will be in October. Um, like I said, assuming everything goes right, I don't want to uh, put the onus on, on Penguin or anything, but I, I am... I believe that is their their plan um, uh, is to do fall releases for the Grimsby books, um, but and and there will be more of the Kitty Familiar in that book. Not quite as much um, as I would like, but the Kitty Familiar is not going anywhere. There you go, Celia. All right, uh, from Anonymous, I get the impression that you've had interesting experiences at Chuck E. Cheese. Do you have any stories you can share? Uh, so I, I, Chuck E. Cheese, I, I have been to regularly. I had a friend of mine growing up that, uh, he had two smaller siblings that were a good six or seven years younger than him. And they always went to Chuck E. Cheese for, so we would, I would go to Chuck E. Cheese twice a year as a kid, but they weren't interesting experiences. They're mostly me and my buddy abusing arcade games to get more tickets. Um, most of the, the Chuck E. Cheese-esque elements in the book are actually inspired by a, a, a horror game series called Five Nights at Freddy's. Um, that I haven't played because I, I I spend a lot more time watching people play video games on my second monitor than I do actually playing video games. But I've seen a lot of gameplay footage of other people reacting to horror elements and stuff in the game. That's been really really fun and amusing. And that was a that was I had that on the background during writing those scenes. Uh, from Anthony, will the next book dive more into how this world is set up and the backstory slash history of the witches and the department? That's the goal. I mean, I don't want to overwhelm people with a history lesson on the world before they are interested in caring about it. You know, that's that's definitely a pitfall that as a writer, you got to avoid. Um, so I, I'm trying to to eat that out steadily. Um, and when it's relevant to the characters, uh, emotionally, when it's relevant to the plot, um, and not kind of, I don't want to bore you guys with what's going on in the world or why the world is the way it is. And some of it, to be honest, I haven't quite figured out why it's the way it is myself. I have a, a decent idea. Um, but uh, there's some mechanics that I've left kind of open, just like I do with the, my milestone writing, where I can come up with a, a cool reason for why it is later. Uh, and this is just why it is now. You know, that that's I try to leave that kind of flexibility. Let's see from Taylor. Why Boston as the setting? Um, I did, I chose Boston because it is essentially uh, the biggest city near Salem and uh, being being a story about witches and and. Uh, uh, having references to witch trials and things like that, Salem obviously seemed the most appropriate American setting for for that sort of storyline. Um, I have never actually been to Boston, unfortunately, so that's on my on my to do list before I write too many more books there, uh, so I can I can go and explore the city a little bit and be a little more comfortable writing in that setting. Um, and I really want to explore that area more in both in the story and its history and kind of find my own parallel to, to start inclu including and incorporating to develop that more. Let's see here. From Leah, uh, how have other authors influenced your writing? Um, I am, I, I consider myself woefully ill-read. Uh, I haven't read nearly as much as I'd like to, uh, especially these past few years, focusing more and more on writing myself. Um, I've I've spent a lot of time watching other writers or listening to other writers or reading other writers talk about writing though. Um, and one of the main ones is uh, Brandon Sanderson. 
Um, he has an excellent series on on YouTube, and uh, he's got a podcast with some of his uh, writing friends. Um, and all of those are are excellent sources that I kind of learned a lot of uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of writing from. Um, and then a lot of the storytelling elements that are like broader stroke things are the things that I've picked up, you know, learning from my father, learning from uh, uh, some of the uh, kind of looking back on older books that I, I reread and I read as a child and liked it, never really figured out why I liked them. Um, and then I got to go back and reread them and figure it out. So the Aragon books were one of them. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, Mistborn books were another one. Um, there's there's a whole bunch that kind of are mishmashed in my brain and kind of I, I have I've been reading enough times and long enough ago that they're kind of more or less part of my internal programming at this point. Um, but the the a lot of the, the effort I spend is is trying to figure out why good stories make me feel the way they do and trying to break them down and figure out how I can try to replicate that for other people. Was it difficult to stay in the same genre as your father's books without making them too similar? Um, part of it was. Um, the other part that made it a lot easier is I haven't read all the Dresden Files. Uh, I uh, I yeah, read. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I read. I, I read <laughs> the first five, and then I didn't want to be too much like the Dresden Files, so I stopped reading them, uh, and I wanted to kind of develop my own path. Uh, but I I read all the Alara books as a as a kid. I really loved those. Um, but the Dresden Files were one of those ones that I, 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 I wanted to make sure that I had my own footsteps to walk in before I knew too well the footsteps I was avoiding. Now, I, there are other pitfalls with that because I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be inc including things that people will say are, I, I took from the Dresden Files. And I probably, you know, I might have had some, some background noise of Dresden Files going on that inspired them as a kid. Um, but there's... I, I'm trying not to rely too much on it while also, you know, creating an own, my own parallel world that people will hopefully find somewhat cool if they like the Dresden Files. From Maya, how has D&D &D and LARPing influenced your writing? Um, that's an interesting question. I spent a lot of time playing D&D &D and a lot of time LARPing. Um, most of the LARPing I've done is very much focused on hitting people with pipe foam more than it is on what is actually going on in the story. Uh, running around and smacking people with pipe foam in the middle of the night in the woods is one of some of the most fun memories I've had as a kid. Doesn't really help contribute to me writing a good story most of the time. Um, unless I happen to have a character running around the middle of the night in the woods smacking things with probably not pipe foam. Um, but uh, as far as D&D &D goes, it's kind of writing is a lot of like building your own D&D campaign that nobody else is playing and you're you have to you have to do the the musical chairs where you go around the table and sit in each person's seat and talk to yourself over and over and over again and then you go back to the main chair and sit down there and try not to spill any of the information to the people that shouldn't know it that you are actually playing as in the other chairs um so it's I think D and D is is an excellent uh, it's it's an excellent practice session for writing your own uh, your own actual story and novel. And then when you actually have people play D and D, it becomes way less useful and way more entertaining uh, because they they throw so many wrenches in what you're trying to do and the cool stuff you're trying to do, and they do wacky and impossible goofy things, and everyone laughs and has a good time. Um, and so you try to you try to capture that emotional element from the D and D table that you're sitting at by yourself. Um, but it doesn't necessarily translate in a one-to-one. -one. All right. Uh, from Anthony, can you explain the magic system for unorthodox and the nature of the elsewhere? Um, I can explain some. I don't want to explain too much. Um, but in, uh, in a, essentially, witches are human pinholes into the elsewhere. Um, that's that's part of where their magic comes from. That's part of why they can breach the gap between the two. They're kind of people with one foot in the real world and one foot in what is essentially the magical world or the world between. Um, and what magic essentially is, is it's a kind of like opening a floodgate and using your own will to shape it as it comes out. Um, the, the, the magic works very differently for different people. Um, and that's why different characters will have different words for essentially the same spell. Nobody says fireball. Pretty much every witch knows how to throw a fireball, except Grimsby. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, 
it, when you when witches utilize magic, part of their impetus is is essentially kind of a filter that helps them control the magic they're bringing in from another world. Um, and as they they run low on energy and impetus, they they stop being able to rely and control that. And for the most part, witches are once they stop being able to control the magic, they stop being able to call the magic through. Um, but the there are elements in the world that are and, and for there, there's an element in the next book, for instance, that um, is a is a pinhole into the elsewhere that is not a person and it changes how things work uh, drastically. And uh, the implications of it are are something that I intend on following through in other stories, uh, future stories. Um, but it, it's it's I try to keep the magic very personal. Um, I mean, I, I'm. I'm a writer. I, I have a lot. It's hard not to incorporate your personal lessons and your personal beliefs into your writing. And so magic in a lot of ways is how I attribute writing to be because you're creating something from nothing, essentially, and you have your own fingerprints all over it. And so that's why I try to make magic in the Grimsby world also similar to. All right, let's see. From Celia, do you use beta readers? Um, I... I have not used many beta readers yet because nobody wanted to read the book for the longest time. Uh, I have, I have, I had one beta reader for this book before I actually uh, uh, took it to the the publisher and 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 tried to pitch it. Um, but uh, the uh, it is something I intend to use. I I I need people that are invested to help me keep track of the stuff that I'm probably going to be stepping over myself or trying to write. And I'm probably going to be contradicting myself because I allow myself that kind of flexibility to write, uh, having somebody say, hey, no, that's not how it works. And, and here you said that here, that'd be very useful to me. So I intend on using beta readers in the future that if I could find people who are willing. All right, let's see. Uh, from Anonymous, can you share a bit about your educational background? Um, I... I Dropout is pretty much the, the main word that sums out my background. I, I tried to, uh, I went to high school. Uh, I did graduate from high school, so I didn't drop out from high school, but I went to the University of Kansas after that. And I went there for what is probably the worst thing you can go there for. I went there for writing, not to say anything wrong about their their program, but I think that's one of the worst things you can go to school for is, is for writing. I think it's way more useful to go for something that you find interesting and inspiring and then write about it after the fact, um, because the the lessons they teach you about writing are not the main ones you need to learn to be able to write books that pe make people feel emotion and make people care. Um, they're, they're how you write books that make people think. And for the most part, you can do both, but it's a lot harder to start writing and have to make people think and make them care about it than it is the other way around. Um, and so I want, I want people to be, you know, I want them to care about the story first and then start to think and ask questions and wonder about how the world and the story works and, and kind of, you know, it become more invested as a result. Um, but the, for as far as for schoolwork goes, I, I went to KU for about three years and I essentially slept through about half my classes and uh, did not do well in a lot of others. Um, I, it was a, it was one of those things where I was not, I don't think I was particularly mature enough and ready to, to really be on my own and hold myself to that kind of standard. And so I did not do particularly well in school. Um, and it wasn't until I'd been out of school and, and been just working a, a part-time day job and, and living on a thousand bucks a month or so for several years that I kind of had the discipline to really figure out, sit down and figure out how to write and uh, pursue the writing goal as a career. Uh, interesting question here. Which actor would you cast for Grimsby? Oh, that is an interesting question. I haven't actually given that no thought because uh, I, I don't anticipate that being a question in the near future or anytime soon. Um, if, if I were to name somebody by uh, right now, they probably would be too old for the part by the time it, it, anything might happen, if anything were ever were to happen. But I, I mean, I'd love Tom Holland, obviously. Uh, I think he'd, he'd be fantastic um, because he's busy. He's been great in most of the roles I've seen. Um, I think that would be that's the first one that comes to mind. I'm I'm really terrible with actors and names. Uh, I'm lucky I got Tom Holland at all just because he's Spider Man. Um, but I, I think that would be my go to. Um, from Anthony, how old is Grimsby supposed to be? Uh, Grimsby in the, this first book is 19. Um, so he's still quite young. Uh, he's he's essentially a, at the same age I was when I started trying to seriously write and. He's doing considerably better at his goals than I was at mine at the time. 
from Robert. I found it really interesting how Grimsby started dressed as a fairy and screamed a lot and then progressed in believing in himself further and ends up in, in an auditor suit. Will Grimsby retain his initial vulnerability? Uh, yes, uh, Grimsby, he, he's kind of, you, in a lot of ways, the, the emotional uh, uh, home, home base uh, for the reader. Like the, he doesn't have a lot of experience with this, this extreme magical element um, that is the, the, the Department of Unorthodox Affairs. That's, they're the ones that deal with all the scary stuff. They're the ones that deal with all the serious stuff. They're the ones that deal with the stuff that most people pr prefer not to think about or hear about. And so he has not really heard about what they they deal with, and he has not really uh, dealt with the things that they 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 combat regularly. And so he is in a, in many ways for a long time is going to be kind of the 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 reference point um, for how the the reader often will feel seeing these things. And so he's gonna he's gonna have emotional reactions that other characters that are more experienced and more versed and more uh, in, embittered to the world won't have, like Mayflower. Um, there, he's going to be a foil to Mayflower for quite some time. Uh, the questions keep changing. Here's a good one. In Magic, what deck do you prefer? Uh, I am I'm the jerk that plays blue decks, is what I am. I, uh, I will play counter spells, and I will stop you from having fun sometimes. I, I do apologize in advance, but I will do it. <laughs> um, uh, but i'll play a blue hybrid with almost anything i'll play blue green is one of my favorites blue red uh i've been playing a lot of azorius blue white lately um but yeah nerd yeah that's me <laughs> um from trisha what is your process when it comes to not only naming your characters but designing them as well um so for a bit uh, I'll, I'll talk about Grimsby and Mayflower because they're obviously the two main characters. Um, my, I wanted to have a cool name for Grimsby, and my rule that I set up for myself was if he had a cool name, he could not be cool. That was that was the goal and the 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 effort. And so uh, I I had a several names I wanted to give him. I gave him all three of them. Um, that's that's why his name is so absurd and ridiculous because nobody could stop me. Um, and. and so he he got he got three names that I find cool at least, and he did not get to be cool whatsoever. Uh, and then uh, Mayflower uh, is the exact opposite of, the, of that rule, where he got to be very cool and very competent, and very in control. And so he did not get a cool name. His name's Leslie. He goes by Mayflower, and everyone calls his ma name Flower, but his name is Leslie. Uh, from Jennifer favorite and least favorite parts of the traditional publishing process as a newly published author? Um, I've had a pretty smooth experience uh, that I think is probably an outlier. Um, so I, I wouldn't take necessarily take my experience with publishing um, with, with a grain of salt. Uh, but the I think the the smoothest part is honestly the editing. It's, it's a lot easier than I expected it to be. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, the, 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 I mean, there's a lot of give and take in the editing process, but it's it's really nice to get other eyes on the project and people that are as experienced as my editors are over at Penguin um, that can find things that I've missed or or suggest things that I haven't considered and uh, help kind of shape the story closer to what I wanted it to be, but and to it was something that I couldn't have made out without them. Um, as far as the the most frustrating part. I don't know if I'd necessarily say I'd been frustrated with anything in particular. Um, I think, I mean, as a new writer, the the time element is probably the most frustrating part because you you sell a book and then nothing happens for the longest time. It's, I mean, I sold you know Grimsby over a year I think before it before it launched, um, and so it was like it was a whole lot of nothing ever changing for over a year, even though I had sold the book, and that was very frustrating. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily attribute that to Penguin or a fault of Penguin. That's just the nature of the publishing in industry. Um, very important question. Captain Marvel or Scarlet Witch? Uh, I think we watched Scarlet Witch kill Captain Marvel uh, at least once. So I'd, I'd, I'd go with Scarlet Witch. <laughs> um, from Celia. Wondering if people will stop putting up mirrors if people keep breaking them and intruding, or is that rare? Can you block a mirror so that people can't use it as a portal? 
Um, so there, there will be ways of making mirrors uh, resistant to people coming through. Um, people using mirrors is not not super common, and it's not common knowledge necessarily. Like it's not well understood that there is to, by the common people that are the usuals, I should say, that there is another dimension called the elsewhere, full of horrible monsters. That's that's not something that they're fully aware of. Um, excuse me. They're and they're more aware that there there is creatures that exist in our world that they don't want to deal with that that do threaten them and that the auditors are the ones that kind of deal with those creatures um and so the the understanding that with that mirrors can be portals into your house is not something that they, most people are aware of all right from Anne, what is your key voice for your writing slash what do you want to be known for humor dialogue battle scenes quotable character quotes something else um, it's not something that I've, I'm not setting out to be known for anything in particular. I'm just trying to develop things that I can, would consider to be my own, in my own skill sets. Um, and I, I obviously want to be expanding those skill sets over time. So, um, Gr the Grimsby's books are, I want to mix humor and horror in a lot of ways. I want to mix light and dark. Um, so there, there's, I want them to have strong contrast to the ups and the downs in the stories. And so that's what I try to focus on. Um, I, I think every book is really reliant on characters. And so I really want to divide, uh, design and create good characters, um, and most importantly, good character interactions, because a character without interaction isn't really a character at all. Um, and so those are the things I've been focusing on. But I, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm setting out to be known for anything. I'm just I'm just trying to write books that people like and uh, hopefully write them better each time. Uh, from Jennifer, I'd like more talk about what inspiration <laughs> for them and will they become a more more integral to Gris, Grimsby's journey? He was my favorite other than Grimsby. Uh, I, there will definitely be more Wudge. Uh, one of the first feedbacks I got from my editor was that she liked Wudge. And so if your editor likes somebody, you've got to kind of keep them around for a little bit at least. Um, but I, that is a common common feedback that I've gotten is that people really like Wudge. And I was always intending on including him anyway, um, but I will try to keep make sure Wudge is, is a little bit more in the limelight than he might have been otherwise because people seem to enjoy him. And uh, I do have uh, pretty big plans for what his impact on the story will be in the future. Uh, let's see another one here. Who was the best Batman? Uh, the best Batman. Hmm. I, I mean, I liked the, the Christian Bale movies. Um, I don't necessarily know if I would say he's the best Batman. He's certainly the, the most serious Batman. Um, I haven't seen the latest The Batman. Uh, I haven't seen that movie. Um, so I can't say one way or another how well he did for his uh, Pattinson, Robert Pattinson, something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, Batfleck just hasn't gotten very much screen time. There, I mean, there hasn't, as to my knowledge, been a Batfleck movie. Uh, so I, I, it's hard to give him a comparison to somebody like Christian Bale, who got three movies that are focused on him. Uh, I thought for what he had, he did pretty well. Um, but, and then there, then there's the old school Batmans, which, which are a little, like I was quite young at the time. And so my, my perception of them is, is very colored, uh, or, or very gray. Maybe, maybe that's the better way to describe it. It's very <laughs> dull. Um, I, I do re remember the, the Batman, I, I can't even remember which one this is. I think it's George Clooney, the Batman with the, the very realistic bat nipples on the costume was disturbing as a child. I do remember that. Um, from Anne, James, you have a resonant speaking voice. Any plans to narrate your own books or maybe do voiceover work? Um, it's something that I've considered. Uh, when I was when I was working on earlier projects, I kind of played around with reading them and recording it and for myself just to kind of hear how it would sound. Um, I mean, I, I think that I will largely leave the, the reading, reading the full novels to the professionals uh, because if they're, they're professionals and they're going to be better at it than I am. And the the time investment is something that I could just be spending writing, and I think most people would prefer that anyhow. Um, but I, I I will probably try to try to narrate some small chapter samples or or maybe a short story or two, something like that in the future, um, just because I think that'd be fun. Uh, from Robert, how was hearing the audiobook compare? How does hearing the audiobook compare to your internal image of the characters? 
so I have, I've only gotten a chance to listen to a couple chapters of the audiobook. Um, I think, I think, uh, the narrator, um, uh, Cronin, uh, he, I think he does a good job. Um, it is obviously different than my internal dialogue, but my internal dialogue sounds like me and I'm tired of listening to me. I listen to me all the time. Uh, and so I, I, I mostly try to try to set that aside when I'm, I'm listening to it. And I think he does a, a fine job. Uh, from Trisha, what is your process for world building, especially when it comes to an urban fantasy story? Um, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, you're like, for instance, what makes urban fantasy urban fantasy is the fact that it's it's something that's recognizable plus magic is is essentially what it boils down to. And so you have to kind of design your magic to keep that world recognizable. If you make magic that is so uh, uh, powerful that it replaces common day things and, and objects and technologies, it stops resembling what people might consider urban fantasy and starts being something more like like shadow run if you if you're familiar with that where it's like sci-fi plus fantasy and like a weird like arcane punk mixture um the i think it's important to to kind of know what your your goal is and know what your genre is but at the same time i don't want i don't think you should constrain yourself within your genre if you want to write beyond it um you want to use the genres as as a tool to help you build your world and not as a limitator um and so you're when you're building, you just have to keep in mind the 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 large scale stuff uh, as as kind of like while you're doing your your broad stroke sketches. But when you're doing the small scale stuff, you want to figure out what makes the 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 elements of magic that you're introducing into your urban setting. What makes those matter to the characters? What makes it interesting or frightening or or expands their experience in some way? And what really what changes it to be to feel personal? Um, because that's really what's going to give your urban setting that you're working on a personal touch and make it feel unique. Uh, let's see, from Anne, hamburgers, pizza, or salad? Uh, not hamburgers, <laughs> uh, but uh, pizza and salad are both fine. Not hamburgers. I have no son. Uh, let's see, from Taylor. Uh, will there be defined black and white slash good and evil, or, or, or do you write more with gray morality? Um, I try to write with extremes, um, and then I try to write characters that are right on the edge of those extremes that have some either redeeming or condemning quality that that muddles their what their alignment would normally be. And so there will be characters that, well, there will probably be character singular that is irredeemable in the books. Uh, I don't know if there will be a character that is is perfectly pure. That That seems a little less possible for me to to really pull off and have it be satisfying. Um, but the, as far as the, the, the gray scale, I think I, I do operate a lot more in grays than black and whites, or at least I try to, um, because I think that is much more relatable in a lot of ways. And, and people will find that more investing than, than something that is, I mean, frankly, just something that's all white or all black on the alignment scale is, is it would be hard for a regular person to process in a lot of ways. Um, and so while those things will probably exist in the Grimsby stories, they probably won't be like humanoid uh, and, or, uh, or people uh, by most definitions. Let's see here from Sean. Since writing is a constant learning and improvement process, what are you trying to improve on in your next book? Um, so the, the second book uh, in the Grimsby series is actually like, uh, chronologically speaking, for for the writing process, it takes place. I wrote it uh, like two and a half or three years after the first book, and so I've I did a lot of work on other stuff that is is more mostly scrap work in the in the interim. Um, but I think my skills have developed, and I hope that shows in the second book. Um, but I I wouldn't say I when consci I consciously worked on stuff as much as I was just consciously trying to get my contractually obligated book ready and complete on time. Um, but the I've been working on a different story right now. And that one I'm focusing on um, having stronger, more dynamic and engrossing fantasy elements um, without making it uh, bright. Like I think a lot of epic and, and large scale fantasies tend to be. It's it, I'm trying to find a way of making something feel epic without necessarily making it feel big. Um, and that's that's mostly what I'm focusing on is is having a, a stronger a stronger language palette in a lot of ways. Um, that I hope is not just me using a thesaurus for the most part. I'm going to cut in here for just a second. 
Uh, I've read the second book. His, there's a significant jump in how well he handles characters between the first one and the second one. I, I was very pleased when I read it. All right, from, uh, let's see, from Janelle. How did, you, how did you discipline yourself to keep up on writing? Did you do a word count, a set time? Um, it was more of a, a write every day. It doesn't matter how much or, or what you work on, just work on it every single day because eventually you're gonna be making progress. Um, and that was kind of my, that's my personal goal is to just in some fashion or another, whether it's working on uh, editing or whether it's actually getting prose down on the page or whether it's um, um, just figuring out the scratch work so I could know where I'm going and what my next milestone is. Um, no matter what it is, as long as you're working every day, eventually you'll, you'll get to where you want to go. Um, but it's, it's once you start having, you know, deadlines that you have to start setting a pace and that the deadlines are a new experience for me. And so I'm still working on, on making sure that I can, you know, keep up enough of a word count to actually meet my deadlines. Um, and so far I've done okay. I've, I've only had one deadline and I didn't miss it. Uh, and so I'm hoping to keep that that uh, going for the, the next few books at the very least. I mean, you got to get real big before you can miss a deadline. And I, I don't intend to miss any. Let's see. Uh, the concept of the magic draining the user has been around for a while. What made you decide to make it actually physically hurt the user? Um it's it's very easy to have so magic has to come at a cost otherwise it feels kind of like cheating um, that's just a common rule for for people building fantasy worlds um, whether that the, I think the best magic systems have a, a very hard to find cost um, but I, I was I when I was building this system I just couldn't find a, a way that I quite liked that was that's a hard a very hard line cost um, and so I wanted to find something that it was a little bit more tangible than just you know, getting tired over time. And so I, I tried to make it so that your, 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 obviously there is that exhaustion element when it comes to magic, but Grimsby specifically, his magic is, is physically painful because of his, 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 his disability essentially. And so I, I want magic to come at a higher cost to Grimsby than everybody else in the book. Um, because he's the perspective and he's the main character and things frankly are just going to be harder for him than they are for everyone else. All right, from Chris, how much input do you have on the book cover art and the reader of the audiobooks? Um, so for the book cover art, I, I got some initial input of kind of what I what I wanted to see. Um, the detail work was not something that I really got much input on. Um, I wanted, like me personally, I wanted his scars to be a little bit more apparent in, in the, the cover art. Um, but um, most of the, the, the art department thought it would be a little too graphic for, for a book cover. And so they kind of toned it down. Um, I also wanted him to, to not be in like a full suit jacket quite yet, because that was a little too close to the, the auditor suit that I wanted him in by the end of the book. Um, but uh, again, it was, it was a more casual uh, outfit than his, like the one he ends up in. So I, I was okay with it. Um, as far as the audiobook goes, um, I had, I had uh, kind of negotiated with Penguin and for my contract to have some influence on the, uh, the narrator. Um, and so uh, once they were kind of in the, in the market for figuring out who to choose, I got a list of people that, and sample chapters um, for, for, of them reading. And I got to choose from about half a dozen uh, potential uh, uh, narrators. And so I, I just chose the one I liked the best. From Janelle, how hard are you on yourself when you write? Do you edit all the whole thing at once or as you go or a blend? Um, I'm probably harder on myself than I ought to be. And I don't plan on changing that too terribly much. Um, but I, I do. So I will get into a rut with a chapter where I, I'm either nervous to write the next chapter because it's big and important or I don't know exactly what I want to happen in the next chapter. And I will edit the chapter before that five, six, seven, eight times. And so there are some chapters that I've edited way more than others because they come right before a chapter that was very difficult for me to write. Um, and that's 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 the main kind of personal hurdle I've noticed in my own like self-criticism and, and personal editing. Um, but when I actually get to the end of the book, that's when I'll go back through and, and try to uh, really smooth out any rough edges and, and make things consistent that I found to be inconsistent or um uh, if I, as I'm reading through or as I'm writing and I get to a chapter and I include something cool that I haven't 
really justified including i'll have to make a note and go back through and include the, something that makes the cool thing i wanted to include actually make some sense and so that's that's the main kind of personal editing that i do uh from robert how much of you as a person is reflected in your characters um well i think it's important as a writer to put a, at least a little bit of yourself in every character because uh, otherwise i don't think you can reliably capture the things that they want to do and say and think and feel and communicate them to the reader if you don't have at least one foot grounded in like an, a common emotion you share with that character um and so i would say that there's a little bit of me in all the characters in some way or another um even if it's that little bit of me is my experience that i have with other people that remind me of that character um, and so I try to capture that and include that consistently as best I can um, so that I can have my characters kind of uh, capture people and different people, because I think different people will like and dislike different characters. And I think that's important to have a, a broad palette of uh, uh, approachable characters in your books. From Anthony, what is the nature of the elsewhere? Is there a reason it is described as a creepy hell-like world? And are there more areas that are less scary? Uh, there are more areas that are more scary, and that's all I can say about it for now. <laughs> good answer. That's a good one. Uh, let's see. Uh, when will the next unorthodox story be ready? Um, I'm I, so I like I said I I have completed the the rough draft for a book two. Um, and I believe my editor is in the process of, of reading through it at, at the moment. Um, and so once that happens and I get back the edited copies, then I, uh, or the edited copy rather, um, it'll go through a few more rounds of edits and I'll get my hands on it and kind of uh, uh, play with it a little bit. And then it'll be kind of out of my hands. I'll just be able to make corrections for a few months. But like, like I've said, the, I think the, the current timeline is sometime in October again. Um, that's, the, that's at least my hope and the goal. From Tabitha, you're wearing a pentagram. Are you Wiccan? It looks like it's made of hematite. Um, this is made out of uh, Damascus steel, actually, um, and it's 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 less of a a, a religious belief or, or a secular belief and more of a personal belief. Um, it's just something to remind me that that magic is very real. All right, James. Uh, I think that's. I think we've we've had you on in, in the spotlight on the hot spot long enough. This is the longest uh, I've we, talked in a long time. Yeah, it really is. He's he's a very quiet person in real life. Uh, let's see. We've got a, we've got we've got just a couple more here. What brand of shirt are y'all wearing? How comfortable are they? Uh, this is the tailored athlete brand of shirt that it's uh, for for people that have kind of weird oblong body types from having lifted weights for the most part. Um, and this one in particular, it's not too bad. Um, it's, it's, it's hard for me to find a shirt that is broad enough to fit my shoulders and narrow enough to not just hang about my waist. Um, but these shirts do a pretty good job of it. And the, that brand is tailored athlete. Uh, let's see. How hard was it for you to essentially torture Grimsby? I don't like the amount of hurt I put on my own characters while writing, but it is necessary for the story. Is there a balance or a payoff to Grimsby suffering so much early on in the series? Uh, well, I, like I said before, I put a lot of myself into the different characters and I think I put the most of myself into Grimsby. And so torturing him was really easy. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I think it's important to, to, kind of early on let your readers in the early on the story let your readers know what they're in for and so it was it would have been disingenuous of me to have Grimsby have a good day to start the book all right everybody thank you so much for your time and for your questions uh James thank you so much for for appearing tonight uh looks like a mission accomplished here I think think so thanks so much guys and thanks to everyone at home so many questions. It was like rapid fire Q&A time. It was great. Um, in the chat, I just put a link to the book. Uh, click on that and you can order James' book from us there. This is what it looks like right here. And thanks, Jim, for uh, joining us tonight as well. This event was recorded and our events can be seen on our YouTube channel. I'm going to put a link to that right there in the chat. So if you want to click on that, you can see all of the other 
uh, Zoom events that we've done the past couple of years and um, a lot of great ones there. You can, uh, this event will probably be showing up there sometime tomorrow. So if you wanna share it with your uh, friends and family, um, you'll be looking for that tomorrow on our YouTube channel. All right, James, Jim, put your family. Uh, thanks so much for uh, this, this great talk. And again, thanks everyone at home. And until next time, have a great night. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.